Half-Life 1, uh, we approximated would take us about a year and a half to build. It took us about two and a half years to build. Half-Life 2, we approximated would take us three to four years to build. It took us almost six to build. So following that trajectory, Half-Life 3 would have taken us eight to ten years to build. Uh, and that just seemed insane. So we decided that we were going to break up the next game into three pieces and call them episodes for better or for worse. Focusing on smaller, more frequently delivered pieces of content is an opportunity for us to push in a direction that would seem much riskier if we were going off doing a 20 or 30 million dollar game project. Whereas if you break that up a bit and sort of limit the cost and limit the time, you're able to sort of take some of the risk in the gameplay and in the design. So we're able to do things like Portal, we're able to do things like a wildly different art style in Team Fortress 2 and to sort of take challenges with things in the episodic uh, games of Half-Life 2. Because the development cycles are shorter, we can really accurately target the hardware that's going to be out when we release. So that's really nice for us. And for our customers, the main benefit is, of course, they get more games more often from us, which uh, we hope they like. So for us, when we took a look at Portal Team Fortress 2 and Episode 2 sort of on a collision course for their release, we said, well, are we going to have these games out at the same time competing against each other or do we want to put them together and have them complement each other? Plus, also including Half-Life 2 and Episode 1, this is probably the greatest collection of games that have ever been offered in one box. You know, it is literally the offer that gamers can't refuse. Valve was founded in 1996 by two former Microsoft uh, developers, myself and Mike Harrington. We'd been developing operating systems and applications, and we had no idea whether people with an operating systems background could do something more entertaining than a disk defragmenter. But uh, we felt that the action genre had become really stultified. And we thought that there was this opportunity for storytelling that could be injected in it, to give people the sense of a world going strange and of an ordinary person who has to become an, a hero through those progression of events. And so we did. That was the beginning of Valve. I think the easiest way to sort of talk about Half-Life, the series, to folks is to say that, you know, this was a game that really sort of puts story in the center of the experience. Half-Life 2 opens much like the first game, with Gordon Freeman on a train. In this case, he, instead of arriving in Black Mesa, he's now in a strange city called City 17. And also sort of uh, being reunited with some of your colleagues from the original Half-Life as well. A big difference between the characters in Half-Life 1 and the characters in Half-Life 2 is that um, now they're not disposable. Alex Vance is one of our proudest creations. Dr. Freeman, I presume. I think gamers latched onto Alex because we developed her character uh, to be more of a real person. I'm Alex Vance. My father worked with you back in Black Mesa. I'm sure you don't remember me, though. Uh, Gordon begins to put together the pieces of what's happened to Earth in his absence. And things are wildly out of control. And you're battling Combine forces, alien creatures. And uh, your job is to free humanity from the Combine. Episode one opens with you and Alex waking up in the rubble below the Citadel, and you've managed to survive the explosion. And um, the Citadel core is nearing meltdown because of what you did at the end of Half-Life 2. Basically, you have to get out of the city, or the whole Citadel is going to go up. But unfortunately, the very first thing you have to do is actually go into the Citadel. Don't worry. We'll see about that. In episode two, you're basically in this race against the Combine forces uh, to take a data packet that Alex has discovered at the end of Half-Life 1 and deliver it to some of the resistance uh, scientists that are awaiting you across this area called the White Forest. In terms of uh, new monsters, we introduce the Hunter, which is a Combine adversary. It's, it's a relative of the Strider. It's like a fast predator. As well, we, uh, we introduce new antline species. Episode 2 is full of a lot of variety. The large outdoor environments really give Episode 2 a, a, an epic feel and allow us to create some of the most freeform, large-scale combat scenarios that we've ever made. Forget about all this.
So Team Fortress 2 is the, uh, the sequel to the granddaddy of class-based multiplayer action games, uh, also developed by uh, then-students uh, in Australia, Robin Walker and John Cook in the mid-90s as a mod for Quake. The inspiration for the art style of Team Fortress 2 came from our internal playtesting. Uh, we had a version of the game up and running, uh, it was very rough and abstract, uh, but it, the more we played it, the more we realised the game was about sort of this over-the-top action where everything's a little exaggerated and we wanted a visual that, that sort of matched that feeling. After nine years of uh, working on Team Fortress 2, I'd have to say the biggest challenge is shipping on time. But beyond that, balancing the classes took us a significant amount of time. When we started Team Fortress 2, one of the first things we were interested in doing was trying to make sure that all the classes were more unique than they were in Team Fortress 1. There are nine different classes in Team Fortress 2. Uh, they're sort of roughly divided into three different groups, the offensive, the defensive, and the support roles. The soldier is sort of the backbone of the offensive group, carrying a lot of firepower and his shoulder-mounted rocket launcher. The scout, on the other hand, is all about maneuverability. He needs to dodge as much as he hits enemies. The pyro is sort of much more about ambushing. His flamethrower is extremely lethal but has a very short range. In the defensive category, you've got guys like the demo man and the engineer and the heavy. The demolitions guy is all about destruction. He has a lot of uh, explosive weaponry. The engineer, on the other hand, builds sentry guns and they kill the enemy for him. The heavy weapons guy doesn't need a lot of explanation. He's got the biggest gun and the most firepower. And then in the final group, you've got the support guys, who are the medic and the spy and the sniper. And they're sort of much more specialized roles. The medic is everyone else's best friend. He's the guy who keeps you alive while you're under enemy fire. The spy is outwitting opponents. He's stabbing them in the back when they think he's their friend. And finally, you get to the sniper. He's the longest range class, of course. He's picking off opponents from miles away. I hope Team Fortress 2 is worth the wait. <laughs> Can I have some more? Portal is, for us, one of the most exciting things that's happened in games uh, in a long time, and it's also a great extension of the Valve philosophy in that it came to us from a group of seven students who were graduating the DigiPen Institute of Technology here in Redmond, Washington. Every year, DigiPen holds an expo for graduating seniors to try and bring in developers to take a look at students' projects and hopefully get them jobs. So a couple people from Valve swung by and took a look at our project and apparently thought it was interesting enough to invite us to come into Valve. They came in and demoed the game for us and about halfway through their demo, Gabe just stopped them cold and said, you guys must come work at Valve and create your next project here on the Source Engine. And two years later, we have Portal as uh, the experimental piece of the orange box. Portal is a mind-bending puzzle game that allows you to manipulate and bend 3D space to your will. The story in Portal is that you are a test subject in the Aperture Science Laboratories. You're basically used as a rat in a maze to try and test the portal weapon. The portal gun works by giving you the ability to create two dynamically linked portals. You have an orange portal and a blue portal. If you go in the blue portal, you'll come out the orange portal. And if you go in the orange portal, you'll come out the blue. One of our favorite portal techniques is called the fling. So what you do is you place one portal close by your feet and you place another portal behind you, high up on a wall. If you jump in the portal, you'll come flinging out the portal that's really high up in the air. And we use this for all sorts of puzzles later on in the game. We hope that the portal gun will change players' expectations much in the same way that the gravity gun did for Half-Life 2. With the gravity gun, players were able to manipulate physics in a way they never had before. And in Portal, you're able to manipulate 3D space in a way that you never had before. This next test is impossible. Have we been surprised by the success of Half-Life? Absolutely. We had no idea when we were starting off that the rules that we had taken out of the community about how to build a game like this we're going to have such a large impact, both in terms of the sales and the critical success of the game. I wouldn't say that the, uh, the best-selling action franchise of all time on any platform is a critical, darling. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, heralded by the critics and won more Game of the Year awards than probably any other action franchise, but it's also sold more copies. So I think when you have the fans voting with their dollars and the critics voting with their awards, you have something that is truly a phenomenon and you know something that can be recognized as you know best of breed. The Orange Box is set to ship on October 10th for the PC and the 360 and in time for the holidays on the PlayStation 3.